Welcome to Maison Otaku. Come in, have a seat. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. Hey, we got a good show today. Yep. I mean, good show. Plenty to talk about. Yep, but first, the news. The news indeed, and the news has a really screwball thing. We haven't seen something like this since uh, Big O2. Yeah. Uh, the last halfway watchable thing since Big O2 in that respect. Mm, yeah. yeah, so apparently um, Netflix had an original anime made for them, a uh, mecha series called Knights of Sidonia, and I figure, yeah, you know, it's something all the new kids would watch, but I figure I'd give it a look. Um, what I can say about it, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, I gave it a look, too, uh, mostly just to, you know, support the project, you know? Yeah. It's a new venue, it's a new production mode, so we're excited to see it. We're excited to see new things created, we're excited to see new mecha anime, because that doesn't happen. Yep. But uh, the show itself, a little clunky, yeah. but still, it's worth It's worth at least that first half hour. Yeah. Well, you're getting it for, uh, well, eight bucks a month technically, but for all you watch on there, virtually nothing, so... I mean... Okay, things I like about it. I do actually like the mecha designs. Um, while there is a lot of stupid crap with the characters and writing, it's at least a show that tries to take itself seriously, which is more than I can give a lot of things. Um, and much more than I give a lot of more recent mecha anime. It actually does have a general serious, you know... This is the situation we're in overtone to it. Things I don't like about it. They use 3D CGI for things they probably shouldn't, which isn't anything new whatsoever, but the frame rate is just... Oh, God, it's like something you would see out of, like, 2001. It's run dim look, yeah. be looked better. It, it's... But on the upside, the art, the background art's really nice. Yeah, it's one it's, of those uh, deals where... You can see that they're really trying a lot of different things. They're doing what they can with a small budget, which is also good to see. Yep. We just, we will say it's not a polished product. It's not a finished product. It's about pilot candidate levels of uh, polish. Mm, maybe same levels of polish, but this still looks better. <laughs> yeah, this does look better than pilot candidate. It just isn't about as polished as pilot candidate. Yeah. Speaking of unpolished things, though, the other piece of news, I think that we made it happen. Yes. We yes. accomplished something here at uh, Maison Otaku. No. no credit whatsoever to the fine people of Discotech and their scouring the back catalogs for worthwhile historical artifacts. Yes, regardless of what their official release dates might tell you. Yeah. Yeah, um, apparently they did an official DVD release of Lily Cat. Yes. Most recently. It's a recent new release from Discotech. Congratulations, guys. Well done, guys. Wrong thing we keep talking about. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Robot Carnival. The answer was... Robot... Carnival. Robot... Carnival. Try again. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but well, that's really it for the news. So, uh, I thought I'd actually kind of pad this segment out by talking about, you know, we didn't make any major finds, so I would say a little bit about what we're looking for right now. And, nope. Mike, you're, what, what's right now the, the, the big thing that you're after? Actually, um, one thing I'm after, and, you know, I can get it cheap enough online, but I, you know, yeah, I don't bother with that unless it's something crazy. Recently came into possession of a PSP only because someone gave it to me for cheap. And I'm trying to remember, you know, actually good games on the PSP, of which there are many, it's just I don't know about them. I completely forgot about R-Type Command. It's a hex grid map, turn-based uh, strategy, uh, strategy game with R-Type ships. And it's cheap. It's like ten bucks. So basically, it's Panzer, it's Panzer General, but with R-Type. More or less. They'll buy it from you if you have it. Yep. Uh, what I'm looking for right now that I'm really thrilled to be looking for is actually, of all things, I'm 
right now doing a little bit of uh, collection cleanup work, as it were. You know, went through the stack and was looking at, wait a second, where did this go? Where is that? And I'm trying right now <laughs> to finish off and replace my first discs, my first and fifth discs of X, the TV series. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence with Clamp a lot of the time. Uh, love Miyuki Chan in Wonderland. Hate Subasa Chronicles. Love X. Can't stand uh, Card Captor Sakura. It's just how I am. But uh, missing my volume one, have the case, missing the disc, uh, and just never quite got a copy of five. But otherwise, I've got the complete set. So lately, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking I want to sit down and watch X on my discs, and I keep remembering I don't have my volume one, and you know, it kind of chased me. So I have to go elsewhere for my fix of uh, dark, brooding characters in a uh, urban wasteland. Yep. Which kind of yep. brings us to our pick yep. of the day, our our focus. This week, we're going to talk to you about one of the great Japanese authors out there, uh, Hideyuki Kikuchi. Now, many of you may not be familiar with his name, but I can assure that most of you are familiar with his works, or at least some adaptation thereof. Right. And it's a lot of fun to talk about an author like this. It, his work really hits home to a lot of folks. So stick around. Things are about to get a little gothic. So we're talking about Hideyuki Kikuchi, and he's a really interesting person. Oh, yeah. uh, been around a long time, born yeah. in 1949, did most of his studying to be a writer in the late 60s, early 70s, and uh, studied with some neat people in a neat place. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, he actually attended a uh, manga school, uh, what was the name of that again? The Gekiga Sanjoku. Yep. Which was founded by a really cool guy too. Yep writer behind Lone Wolf and Cub. So... Yeah. But, I mean, we had a lot of great uh, mangaka come out of this school. I believe it was uh, Rumiko Takahashi, I think, uh, got her start in there. So did the fellow behind uh, my pick, uh, my last recommendation, Fist of the North Star. Mm -hmm. So a good melting pot of great ideas and great talent that produced a lot of what is the manga landscape of the modern day. Yep. And uh, one of the great things about uh, uh, Kikuchi is just he also picks some of those great names to work with constantly. Yeah. Um, his novels are routinely illustrated by Yoshitaka Amano, who I talked about in my Colossal Con video briefly. Um, and one of the great directors oh, usually absolutely. handles the anime adaptations of his stuff. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much every time a uh, Kikuchi work has gone from book to screen, it's been handled by uh, Madhouse alumni and noted crazy person Yoshiaki Kawajiri, yep. who's done beautiful work and pretty much beautiful work and pretty much everything he's yep. done, and has that really great liberally copied from. Uh, the great oh, Sergio Leone. Yeah, from yeah. Sergio Leone. Yeah. It's, it's take Sergio Leone Cowboy Western, add samurai and maybe demons, you have a Kawajiri movie. Yes. Which is awesome. Yeah. But and I, yeah. Kikuchi's material just works so perfectly for that aesthetic with a mono character design, so you have it, breathtaking it, work, yeah, no matter it, what it is. It is a powerhouse combination. So we're basically just going to give you a rundown of some of his stuff, uh, mostly the ones that have had anime adaptations of them, and talk about what they're about and why they're important. Yeah, and he is prolific, and he is very noteworthy for at least one piece of work. We're not talking about that yet. You may even know what we're talking about, but we're not talking about that yet. We are talking about Demon City Shinjuku, though. Oh yeah, I, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. His first novel, too, yep. in 1983, so one year older than me. Yeah, three years older than me. 
and really cool. Uh, very basic setup. Tokyo's ripped apart. Demons come up. One man, sorcerer sort of guy, yep. responsible for it all. Uh, wandering youth. Finds out he's got magical powers. Finds a mysterious girl. Just mysterious girl. Who gets kidnapped besides, well, I gotta yep. defeat the evil guy, rescue the beautiful girl. Fights his way through a demon-filled city. Yep. Well, and it's, it just has this... It's... It's gothic horror combined with cyberpunk, almost. Yeah, it's really got that almost cyberpunk yeah, feel As to most it. of Kikuchi's works do. Yeah. Kikuchi loves to waffle on that really thin line between science fiction and fantasy horror. And he's really one of the very few people that ever pulls off that blend really well. Mm. And it's also kind of cool because, you know, it was happening in that really neat early 80s time that also gave us uh, the FASA Shadowrun mm -hmm. games, yep. which have a lot of the same ideas. You know, yep. what if we take the great high fantasy traditions that we're getting turned over and re yeah, and reinvested in in the late 70s, if you read any heavy metal magazines, yep. and then infuse them with this Philip K. Dick, William Gibson, exciting cyberpunk stuff. Yep, and I mean, I uh, I think you really hit the note on the head there. If uh, like a lot, Kikuchi kind of does a lot of sort of heavy metal if it was anime. Yeah, if if there were more Japanese artists working in heavy metal magazine, which I'm sure there have been oh, some yeah. over the years, it'd be Kikuchi stuff. Yep, like Demon City Shinjuku, or it's alternative take because there were kind of two films built off the same book. Well, no, they were they were two two novels. But it was sort of him doing two novels on more or less the same material. Yeah, because you had Wicked City as well. And Wicked City's a lot more violent than Demon City Shinjuku. As Demon City Shinjuku is a little bit more uh, personal, a little bit more of a, a hero's quest, whereas Wicked City is just how <laughs> warped can this get? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's actually also a live-action movie of it, which I have a, a, a bootleg of. Um, it's it's exactly what you would expect. Yeah. And you can find both Wicked City and Demon City Shinjuku. They were big players in the uh, VHS era. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe both were U.S. Manga Core. Both were U.S. Manga Core. And both got picked up by Urban Vision, I believe. Yeah. Wait, no, I don't think Shinjuku got picked up by Urban, Urban Vision, but I know Wicked City did. Yeah. And just really fun two films to find. Lovely films, kind of a good yeah. head start. But the, the main uh, um, difference between them is, like he said, Wicked City is about, okay, boobs and guts. It's... The whole movie is just a... It, it, it's an action film, essentially. Yeah. Demon City Shinjuku, it's more toned, it's more paced, it's all about atmosphere, and actually, there's some really good messages at the part of it, at the heart of it, like, um... One of my favorite scenes in it, I'll just discuss briefly, uh... The, uh... The hero guy and the girl, um... The girl has some sort of, uh... Latent psychic abilities. And they're in this, uh... See, basically... During the battle, or the, yeah, the battle where the sorcerer sort of raised the city to the ground, it became this blacked out region filled with ghosts and vagrants and just all kinds of, the dregs of society living side by side with demons. But one of the things that made it nasty, in addition to a hellgate being ripped open there, it deals with a lot of the same um, themes that, you know, uh, what was it, Violence Jack and a lot of the other post-apocalyptic stuff does that's really based on a lot of people's experiences that, you know, survived the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this, yeah. the place is haunted by these angry spirits of people whose lives were just abruptly ended. Mm -hmm. And they're in some ruins with this uh, little girl's ghost, and there's just a vent... I won't go into it too much, but essentially just this wall of angry spirits erupts, just shooting flame, destroying everything, tearing everything apart... And, you know, the guy's, like, freaking out, taking cut. Well, maybe not freaking out, but he's like, what the heck are we going to do about this? And the girl 
just walks over to the little girl and like gives her a hug and like she's just saying like it's okay you're safe now and it's really a touching scene and yeah. you know the anger subsides and you actually see like the spirits actually sort of pass on yeah uh almost keeping with the theme too of ruin yeah, ruined uh city he does a lot with tokyo's destroyed which is not surprising That's, for a kid born not long after yep. the end of World War II. Uh, the other big piece he does that I like a lot, I do like the OAV a lot, despite the fact that it's kind of bad, is Dark Side Blues, which was see, Kikuchi's manga. Yeah. See, I actually, I rather like Dark Side Blues, to be honest. It's, um... Although I will admit, despite liking it, I don't have too too much to say about it, to be honest. It's kind of hard to have a lot to say about Dark Side Blues. Uh, you almost get the impression that Dark Side, who is this wandering, mysterious sorcerer character that Kikuchi creates, who travels through the ruined corporate takeover remnants of Tokyo in a horse-drawn carriage... Yeah. You almost get the impression that this is Kikuchi's own sort of self-projection, this really mysterious, gorgeous guy that everyone's always talking about. Oh, I wonder what he's going to do next. I wonder if he's ever even going to show. Because he's not even really like a big player in the town so much as he's a force of nature. You know? Well, I mean, also that he's less a character within the story and more of a dramatic foil, to be honest. Yeah. It, really cool. A lot of the artwork... Darkseid's introductions, Darkseid's appearances are always really, really neat. Yeah, he, he's kind of almost a Gandalf-type character, really. Yeah, almost. Uh, none of that kind of brings us to Wind Named Amnesia, doesn't it? <laughs> a little bit. Okay, I just want to go out and say, here's my thing about a Wind Named Amnesia. Back in anime's heyday, you know, when, you know... Well, even when over here, you know, I hadn't quite caught on just how bad a lot of new stuff got. I would talk crap about A Wind Named Amnesia. I mean, it looked pretty regardless, but... I'd argue his crap about A Wind Named Amnesia because I did like it, even if I admit that there's a lot of stuff in there that just makes you cringe. Yep. But the main thing about it with me is it's one of those case-in-point ones I always talk about where the crappiness of new anime made me realize that I liked it. It's it's right up there with, don't get me wrong, it's still bad, but I've come to understand that, you know, uh, what is it, M.D. Geist is actually fairly watchable compared to some of this crap. Yeah, uh, we would certainly rather watch A Wind Named Amnesia than, say, Gundam Seed, but that's not giving it all that much credit. It's, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, America gets nuked. Yeah. And nobody remembers anything about what the town, you know, what their towns were like. It's it's a memory nuke. Yep. And you've got our hero traveling from one end to the other to help this girl find her family. Mm -hmm. Solid concept. It's just at each juncture where they meet new people, <laughs> you get the impression that maybe Kikuchi doesn't like Americans very much. I mean... Totally understandable, totally forgivable, everything within its own context is just, well, the black cop. Uh, he, uh, he didn't really bother me any, it's the, that was the least of that movie's problems, if you ask me, but... Yeah. The main, main thing is, it's kind of, it, it's going on about, you know, the whole, like, philosophical argument it's trying to make, and in my head I'm just going... Yeah, there is a little bit of that, too. And for all of its wankery, yeah. it doesn't really have a point. No. It, it doesn't even really end. It, it, it's really more about the emotional context than anything, which it, it does okay. Yeah, if you can but, get in the emotional headspace of the film, you'll like it. If you can't, some cool visuals? Yeah, well, I mean, especially, like, uh, there's a pretty good animation in some parts, uh... Mm -hmm cool designs, there's... It, it has a good tone to it, I guess you could yeah, say. good tone, good exercise in film. Not going to be the worst thing you'll no. watch, but 
you'll probably look at the tape afterwards and go, eh, I paid a dollar for it. Yeah. But if you want to watch something really awesome by Kikuchi, stick with us. We got that saved just up for you. Yes. The best is saved for last. So, we are, of course, talking about Vampire Hunter D, which is a kind of long series of light novels, uh, two theatrical films, a really good manga, and a halfway decent PlayStation game. Yeah. All of which are available over here. So, you've got no excuses. Yep. Uh, the novels are really good. Um, finally got my hands on uh, most of them. I did buy the first one the same year it was released, though. Uh, yeah. Read that pretty well cover to cover right away. Um, actually, really um, nice thing about it is, you know, people always talk about, you know, oh, you know, the movie's never going to be as good as the novel. But I think we all know... Well, have you read the first novel? Yeah. And... Well, I think we all know what famous scene the movie has that the novel doesn't. That, that, that wonderful closing that... that Bye, D. That that is if if you haven't seen the first Vampire Hunter D movie, that that's one of the most memorable scenes in all of anime right there. Yeah, Vampire Hunter D as a franchise has been around with us since the dawn of anime as a standalone mm -hmm. hobby, as opposed to an underground hobby. Uh, the great thing about it is it embraces so many different aspects of the fandom and so many different ideas and just runs with them all. Yep. Uh, very simply, you have a very, 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 very far-flung future. Uh, I believe it actually takes place about uh, 10,000 years in the future. Right. And through famine, plague, nuclear war, all the different apocalypses you could imagine, yep. you've got a society of Humans and vampires. Yep. And the society of vampires has fallen. Yep. Yeah, essentially, um, I believe it even says, uh, it gives an actual date in 1999, supposedly we all nuked ourselves, and, you know, vampires have been around this whole time, but they took this as like, oh, look what the stupid humans did. Um, feudal state? Feudal state. And it's so cool, just the way this world comes together. And into this world steps the mysterious Hunter D. Yep. Which I'm just going to ruin his background for you because while well, they tell you in the first damn book and in in the first movie anyway, is essentially the son of the Count Dracula. Yes. And D is cool. Oh yeah. Everything he does is cool. Yes. He's dry, he's cynical, he's very quiet, and he's just cool. Yeah. Well, uh, when me and my friends were watching the first movie together once, uh, uh, essentially, this one girl basically comes naked and throws herself at him, and they're like, "Ah!" Oh, and he's just like, like, like he, his face just says, "Not interested." Well, at least not in that about her. And we joked like, "Yeah, his resolve stat is too high." Yeah. And everything ar around the films too is cool. Just the world is so engaging. The characters' de encounters really make 
the stories mm -hmm. happen. And got a good dub from the Streamline the first time. Oh around. yeah. Yep. Uh, the first film was really visually pretty cool. But interestingly enough, Hideyuki Kikuchi, the author who worked very closely with Kawajiri and Amano, complained that, and I quote, it looked a little cheap. Yeah. Well, also about, the, like, don't get me wrong, I still like Doris's design in the movie, but they completely changed it uh, from what it was in the uh, novel, basically. You know, fully covered up actually looks like, you know, uh, uh, post-apocalyptic, demonic-filled wasteland, more or less farmer slash fighter. In the movie, she looks like a St. Pauli girl. Yeah, which is kind of off-putting, but at the same time, it, it works. It works, yes. But some 15, 20 years after the first film, mm -hmm. uh, Kikuchi, after many fans were asking, you can do another movie? You can do another movie? Decides, okay. And he goes back to his buddy Kawajiri at Studio Madhouse and says, you and Amana want to make another movie? Yeah. To which they're, of course we do. Uh, third novel any good? The third novel being Demon Death Chase. Yep. Well, they basically decided to make it on the third one because the second novel, Razor of Gales, is, is just kind of okay. Yeah. Just kind of okay. Uh, interesting premises in that one. The second volume of the manga interpretation covers it really well. So that's a good route to go, but Demon Death Chase was just a really, yep. really good story. And actually, the story of that, a lot of themes, and it kind of brings me to another great reason that you should read D. Vampire Hunter D is basically what I recommend to all those misguided people who read Anne Rice and Stephanie Meyer's novels. And especially Demon Death Chase. It's, hey, this is what Twilight would be if it was cool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Girl runs away with a suave vampire. Mm -hmm. And it is a really cool idea because it's beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And they they keep the reveal very close to the end. A lot of the cards of the story are played close to the chest. And the way everything is laid out, it plays like steampunk vampire fistful of dollars. Yeah. If you Which, like that description, this is the perfect movie yep. for you. Yeah, again, Kawajiri doing his usual knocking off Sergio Leone, which, again, we are not knocking. No. Continue that, that, to do that. Do that. Yep. And, and yeah, it, it really has that, you know, that sort of Wild West feel to it while keeping with the, you know, post-apocalyptic, well, not even post-apocalyptic, it's damn near 10,000 years after the apocalypse. But it, it's it's also kind of because vampires have almost been sort of punted to extinction again, not really giving anything away. They explain that right at the beginning. Uh, like, these great castles that, you know, they well, the vampires that call themselves nobles once lived in are themselves ruins. Humans are kind of, like, eking out their own existence in the world once again. So you have these vast ruins, even though it's long after, thousands of years after the Earth rebuilt itself from the nuclear apocalypse. Oh, absolutely. And the scenery throughout Bloodlust. Oh, Lust. yeah. Everything in Bloodlust is animated perfectly. Mm -hmm. there, in fact, there's a particular scene with some uh, sand stingrays that was an absolute nightmare for the animators. Yeah. Uh, and I got really lucky. In 2001, Urban Vision teamed up with Studio Madhouse to bring Vampire Hunter D to theaters mm -hmm. in the United States. Yep. Six theaters. Yep. But one of them was the Cleveland Institute of the Arts. Yep. And I was there opening night, and I can not describe to you. Oh, yeah. And, and that brings, you know, to a side note that's really important to talk about of a special thing in our lives, that sort of resurgence that followed that of anime in the theaters. Yep. If you have not experienced that, they're still doing it. In fact, they actually, um, about a year ago, they showed, the, of all things, the um, well, the uh, Eureka 7 movie in a the theater. Yeah, and uh, the Madoka oh, yeah, yeah, Magica movie was over at the Cedar Lane. Yeah. But 
Yeah, but I was. We were actually both there at the Cleveland Cinematheque, who didn't even know each other at that no, point. No, we were just. And I'm just. And my cousin, my cousin, just like, hey, Mike, you want to go see Vampire Hunter D? So like, he didn't really like explain to me. I'm thinking, oh, okay, I never saw the old one yet. And it was like, oh, this is a new Vampire Hunter D movie, and I'm just like, and it starts. I'm just like, yes, it was so fantastic, and. I mean, every scene was great, but the one that sold it for me is D with the arrow. Yeah, D with the arrow. That on is the big screen. That on, is well, on the big you know what? You know, just... take a look. Right there. Yeah. Don't you want to see that? Yep. Don't you envy us for getting to see that in theatrical seats? That's it sold it. It yeah. sold the and whole thing. And the great thing is just the variety of people that were there. It was everyone from like little, relatively little kids to freaking. I saw some people in their like seventies and eighties mm -hmm. in there. And everyone through, and it was it was art professors in there. Mm -hmm. It was film buffs. It was a film that had. Everyone mm -hmm. thrilled to see it, and it carried such a emotional weight to oh, it yeah, as definitely. well. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong; I'd be lying if I said the movie was completely without flaw. But I still think it's fair to say that it's one of the best anime ever made. It's it, it's definitely up there with the greats from the golden age. Yeah, it's one of the very last of the true cell painted films. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely everything you could possibly want out of a movie and it's still out there it's one of the pricier dvds you're going to find because urban vision really only put out so many of them and it was pricey when it was first released i remember yep. the, the stab of what i paid for my copy no i well heck i bought a vhs brand new at fye shortly after it was released and that cost me about 20 25 bucks yeah. Granted, it's FYE, so you know. Yeah. But, absolutely. Watch the first film, because the first film is so historically important mm -hmm. to the fandom. But watch the second film, because there's so little that's better. Yep. And, of course, we talked about, you know, got the manga reinterpretations of it. Yeah, the manga reinterpretations. Beautiful artwork in that, too. And, uh, like I said, there's actually a uh, PlayStation video game about it. Um, it's kind of, sort of, a retelling of the second movie. You know, same character design, same premise. It's just, if the whole thing... There's a castle they get to at the end. It's basically if the whole movie had taken place inside the castle. And it kind of plays like this weird mashup of, like... It's very Resident Evil, almost. Yeah, it, it plays a little oddly... But it's a fun piece, and it's moderately collectible. Yes. So, yeah. Vampire Hunter D. Yep. Get some. So this week, it is, of course, Justin's turn, and he's going to talk to you about something we've mentioned a few times, but we're going to actually get into it now. Don't you just love it when it's my turn? <laughs> yeah. I love it when it's my turn, because then I get to talk to you about something like Rose of Versailles. And Rose of Versailles is kind of important. It's a big deal. Uh, picked up by Discotech, brought here some 20, 30 years after it was created. And it's really about as critical to shoujo as you can get. Yep. It introduces the idea of the cross-dressing soldier. Well, if you discount... Princess Knight. If you discount Princess Knight. <laughs> and it does it really well, you know. French noble, fr old in the years leading up to the French Revolution, has a daughter, wanted a son, decides, ah, screw it, close enough, raises his daughter as a son. The daughter becomes the leader of the royal guard, 
and pretty much just stands around making glib comments on how absolutely stupid everyone around her yep. is, while uh, you know, uh, Marie Antoinette does the whole Marie Antoinette thing, and yep. you get a lot of the, the Tempest in a Teacup yep. backroom politics. Yeah, it's... It really is, and this is actually quoting a comment I heard in a uh, panel at a con a few years ago, but it just sums it up perfectly. Revolutionary Girl Utena is, I'm sorry, uh, Rosa Versailles, I mean to say, is basically what you would get if Revolutionary Girl Utena and Legend of the Galactic Heroes went back in time and had a baby. Yes. And that's really the other big thing. If you like Revolutionary Girl Utena or Chevalier Dayon, mm -hmm. This is the progenitor. This is where they both come from. This is what they both refer to. Yep. And uh, as you, I just said, and as we hinted to in one of our earlier episodes, it's basically L-O-G-H for girls. Yeah, it is. And it's it's wonderful. I mean, it's got one of the coolest opening themes I've ever heard. I really do like the opening. I like the opening theme for uh, Rose of Versailles as much as I like the Cutie Honey opening theme or the Loop on the Third opening theme. Which is kind of interesting company to put yeah. the uh, story of the French Revolution in with uh, the story of the greatest thief ever. Yeah. But it's just, it's fantastic work. It's on Hulu. You can blitz through the early bits of it pretty easily on Hulu. And you'll enjoy it. And it's one of the great, strong female characters that we had in the golden age of anime, mm -hmm. of anime. I mean, o you know, Lady Oscar is almost as strong of a female character as Queen Emeraldus. Yep. Which, once again, establishes that Lady Matsumoto is superior to something else. Yes. So with that, it is time to end. And we will end today. We're wrapping up today. Although we would like to say a special thank you to me. <laughs> for being me. Because I like me. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> From us here at Maison Otaku, this is Mike. And Justin. Saying enjoy what you watch. And share what you enjoy. Mm -hmm.